Good morning. Will you stand with us as we worship our King? The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated forever. He is glorified forever. He is lifted high forever. He is raised. My best friends um, that I met a few years ago. She grew up in the church. She was a pastor's kid, so that means she knew all the Bible answers, but many obstacles were in her way, and that led to some doubts and some fears that sprung up in her life. And she turned, and she was completely opposite of how she was raised, and she became an agnostic atheist, meaning she didn't believe but also didn't think we can ever know whether a God exists. But her story didn't end there. God used people and prayer to lead her back to him. She and her husband now are pursuing a degree in biblical justice by sharing the healing love of Jesus Christ with those around her. So when you think of your one, as we talked about last week, don't lose hope and think that someone is too far gone to know Jesus. Because God is writing many stories that are taking our weaknesses and pointing to his power. So in front of me, like we did last week, there are ping pong balls that represent our ones. 
the ones that we are trying to reach, the ones that need to know Jesus. So during this next song, I invite you, if you have not participated in this, to come forward, write your one on your ping pong ball, and drop it in the tank. And for those that have participated in this last week, we just want you to take this time to intentionally pray for your one. Because there is power in prayer, and there's power in the name of Jesus.
you missed something somehow. Can we play that sermon bumper? I thought we had it in there somewhere. I just had to begin with that. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. You know, we've been talking about taking it to the streets. We've talked about why we should want to take it to the streets. We've talked about uh, what it looks like to take to the streets. Uh, I want to recap a little bit of both of those, but I want to talk to you this morning about how we take it to the streets. Um, I want to talk about how we've done that in the past as a church, how we do that as individuals, and how we're going to do that and need to do that in the future. You know, taking it to the streets. And we talked about it being the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we don't want to keep that to ourselves. We want to get it out there into the world. We want to take it to the streets. Uh, but how are we going to do that? Uh, you know, it's kind of tough uh, in our world to do that. And sometimes um, it's difficult to know how to do that in a way that works and is effective uh, because things have changed a lot over the last several years. Uh, churches have changed. Our society has changed. People's receptivity has changed. And so uh, we have to navigate and figure out how do we take it to the streets. Uh, my sermon is simple this morning. One mission, two mandates, and many methods. One mission, two mandates, and many methods. And I want to talk to you about that. Uh, the mission, first of all, is found in Matthew chapter 28, if you have a Bible app. Uh, or a Bible, feel free to turn there. Matthew 28, uh, we'll look at this verse a couple of times. Uh, Matthew 28, verse um, 19 and 20. He says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations. That's the mission. Um, if we had a purpose statement or needed a purpose statement, Jesus gave it to us right here in Matthew chapter 28, as he commissioned the disciples, he said, your purpose is to go into the world and to make disciples. And he told them how to do that, teaching them and baptizing them uh, and doing that to the end of the age. But the goal is to make disciples. Um, if we were a business, we would be in the disciple development business. That's our goal. That's our purpose. That's why we exist as a church. And you know, that's rather simple to measure, isn't it? You know, when you have a goal, it's important to have metrics to see if you're attaining that goal or reaching that goal. Are we fulfilling that purpose? Well, it's, it's an easy uh, a, a goal to measure. Uh, the metrics of, are we reaching people for Jesus Christ? Are people being transformed? Is life change happening? Is it, are we growing as a church? Are we helping people to find and follow Jesus? That's one of the reasons our purpose statement or our mission statement is, is, is finding people and helping them follow Jesus, helping them to find and follow Jesus because that's how you become a disciple. I was doing a little study uh, <clears throat> this week, and I was looking back in our history, and um, this is one of the newsletters. I, it was interesting because... I have a whole box in my office uh, that Mary Kinsell loaned me. Mary used to be the one who put all these together uh, for, what, about 250 years you did that, Mary, right? It felt like 250 years. I, I think 20 years, or give or take, uh, she, she would put together our newsletters. And uh, they're really well done. It, it's fun to go through, and I've gone through every file. Now, I say every file. She gave me about 10 years' worth. Uh, I think she has like four more boxes. I haven't gone through those. Um, but it's interesting when you pull the file uh, just to read about the history of the church. Who were the leaders back then? Here's, here's some of their goals and some of their values. Um, here's a perspective by the preacher. Here's some announcements by the associate staff. Here's what they were doing for the teens and for the children. There's a big thank you uh, in here. 
And then there's attendance figures, facts and figures. And then there's a little history on our debt when we built the building and how much we borrowed and how much was given and donated and all those kinds of things. There's a calendar in here. Um, then there's a serving schedule for the nursery. That's important. Got to have that, don't we? Uh, can't get along without that. Um, back then, we had a VIP ministry, very important person ministry, a VIP ministry. And you see all these names. Uh, lots of people were involved in service and ministry. There's a beginner church schedule. And, and down here, there's a whole schedule for communion servers and greeters and hosts and hostesses. All this stuff is rather interesting. On the back is the thing for missions. But here's something that really intrigued me. And a lot of church newsletters don't always include this. Uh, but Mary, um, you can attest and probably give us some history on this. Um, our church was very diligent at tracking how they were doing uh, at the mission, how they were doing at making disciples. And so there's this whole paragraph, a long paragraph, mind you, of decisions, uh, disciples. It says, God continues to move in people's lives as evident by the people, uh, by the public decisions being made. November 23rd, uh, Jimmy Iman was immersed into Christ. December 4th, Lori Luck uh, came to make her confession and be immersed by Julia Heilman. The next night, Tom Rhodes, Greg Goins, Stephanie Goins, and Casey Conacher all came to be immersed in the Lord. B Barb Rhodes also came as an immersed believer to join our fellowship. Uh, they were introduced to our congregation on December 22nd. At the first service on December 8th, Art and Nyla Sanderson came as immersed believers to place their fellowship here at Mid Rivers. And, and that's only half the list. The, the list goes on. That's only half of it. And, and, and I just thought, you know, I'm just going to pull a random newsletter out, and, and we'll just see what it says. This was the first one I pulled out. It's 1997. I just pulled it out of the file, and faithfully so, our church was tracking how they were doing it, making disciples. Uh, they were doing an awesome job, amen? A lot of disciples have been made throughout the years right here at Mid Rivers Christian Church. Hundreds, I, I, I would dare to say thousands of people have come to Christ through the ministry of Mid Rivers Christian Church. A, and our church was very diligent, very faithful, very astute, and, and they tracked. Now, why is that? Because it was important to make sure that they were doing what they were here to do. It, they want to make sure they were on purpose. And, you know, that can shift in the church over time. We talked about in the very first message that I gave how some churches over time can have what's called mission drift. And, 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 and we begin to focus on internal things and maintenance things rather than external things and mission-driven things. And, and honestly, we've had periods in our history that I think we've experienced mission drift. And we need to be on mission. What's the mission? The mission is to go and make disciples. Plain and simple, that's why God put us here. You know, when you think of churches, people have a lot of ideas about what churches should be doing. You know, well, why does a church exist? Well, it exists to marry people. Well, yeah, it does that. It exists to, to, to have funerals and to bury people. Yes, it exists to do that. It, it exists to baptize. Yes, it exists to have classes. It exists to, to be involved in missions and feed people in the community and across the world. Yes, that's missions. Those are all good activities. But those are things that the church does. But the goal is to make disciples. And brothers and sisters, we've got to constantly remind ourselves of that. That's got to be in the forefront of our minds. We exist to help people find and follow Jesus because that's the definition of a disciple, one who finds Jesus and then one who follows Jesus. And so that's our goal. That's our mission. Um, I got really excited about this. I got excited about this, and when I was going through this several months ago, um, almost every single file, almost every single newsletter, uh, matter of fact, I don't know that I found a newsletter. Now, at one point, they quit tracking it, and I don't know. Mary, I'd love to have an offline conversation uh, as to why that was not put in. Uh, I'm sure there's an explanation to that, but for years and years and years, 
uh, the church was very faithful at tracking that. And you can pull out almost any newsletter you want, and almost any week and any month, you'll find that people were giving their lives to Jesus Christ through Mid Rivers Christian Church. They were becoming acquainted with their Lord and Savior Jesus. I don't know about you, but there is nothing that will fire a preacher up more than people come to Jesus. Amen? Amen? I long for the day that that will be the case with us again. That those baptistry waters, they're churning and burning because people are being baptized for Jesus. Amen? Amen. We need to see life transformation. We need to reach out and help people come to Jesus. That's our goal to develop disciples. That's our mission. And that mission in Matthew 28, it's repeated over and over again in all four Gospels in some form or some variation. Luke 24, John chapter 20, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Mark 16 verse 15 and 16. That same mission worded in different ways is brought up time and time again that the church's purpose, the reason we exist is to make disciples, help people find and follow Jesus. That's the one mission. Let me talk to you about how we do that, the two mandates. Uh, in Matthew 22, uh, we see one mandate. In Matthew 22, verses 34 and following, um, there was a man who came to Jesus and he said, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment of the law? And in verse 32, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. Uh, this passage of Scripture has often been called the great commandment. To love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And you know, when we love our neighbor as ourselves, we will reach out to our neighbors in care and concern. And here again, we as a church throughout our history have done this in a, a, a myriad of ways. I wanted to share with you one way recently. Uh, I have some pictures that I'd like to show you. Um, this is a picture of some garden boxes at Our Ladies Inn. Our Ladies Inn is a ministry and a mission in our area to help women who are pregnant uh, they provide protection and safety for ladies who, who want to have babies, but they don't have support from home. And so Our Ladies Inn ministers to them. And if you recall last year when we did our Thanksgiving offering, part of our Thanksgiving offering went toward Our Ladies Inn. Uh, we sent them some money to help them, uh, but in addition to just sending money, um, Recently, and I've got to give credit to Bruce and Heidi and, and Mary Lee and Ben, uh, they were the key drivers and the key ones that helped with this, uh, they built garden boxes uh, in the name of our church. Uh, they needed help uh, when spring rolled around, and, and they helped build garden boxes. And in the second picture, they also uh, refinished and repainted the deck and, and the floor uh, of Our Ladies Inn. You should have seen the picture before. It looked really ugly. And uh, they scraped all that off and, and, and washed all that off and then painted that and made it really nice and conducive for the moms and the kids to have a place just to hang and relax. Um, to me, I think that's what a church does. That's one way we show that we love our neighbors. Uh, we, we care about our community, and we get out, and we get involved in our community. You know, years ago, I was asked a question. If your church ceased to exist, would anybody in the community even know it? Now, think about that for a second. If your church all of a sudden ceased to exist, would the community notice the difference? I would hope that the community would notice the difference. Um, we want to be a church that cares about our community. Uh, we want to be a church that reaches out into our neighborhoods. We, I call this servant evangelism. Jesus said they will know us by our love. And we show our love when we reach out and we help people in need. 
And that's just a small way uh, that our church did that recently. And I appreciate, once again, Bruce and Ben and families uh, for really being the drivers and the key leaders on that. Um, awesome, awesome, awesome. And I think when we seek to fulfill the Great Commandment, um, we'll also fulfill the Great Commission. And notice that the Great Commandment is not the Great Suggestion. Here again, it's a commandment. He says, if you want to prove that you're a disciple, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. That's how we show that we're true disciples. That's how we show that we're really the church. We don't just love ourselves. We love those around us. We reach out to them. And the Great Commission, another version of this is Mark 16, verse 15. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Um, now, for some of you, you see that verse, you go, wow, I, I don't know, that's preaching that's for the preacher. That ain't for me. Um, no, 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 no. Uh, that's for all of us. If this is better, the NLT, I'll, I'll use that version. Jesus said to his followers, go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. How many of us can tell good news? I, I'd much rather tell good news than bad news, wouldn't you? Uh, if I'm going to share something, I'd rather be able to share good news. Uh, good news is easy to share, isn't it? And, and good news is fun to share. Uh, my wife and I have a little joke once in a while. Uh, she'll say, do you want to hear some good news? I'm like, please. All I ever hear is bad news, you know. You watch the news, it's all bad. I want to hear some good news for once. Do you want to hear some good news? Yeah, I want to hear some good news. I love this quote. This quote comes from Rick Warren. It says, a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. I believe that. I believe when churches love their neighbors, I believe when churches love people enough to reach out, to serve, to care, and to show that they care about the community, uh, that they care about people's souls, I believe that stands out. I believe people notice that. You know, when I began this series, I made the comment to you all that I don't want this just to be another sermon series. I really want this to be a pivotal, like, like, aha moment in our fellowship. You know, it's interesting. Churches all over the world, they talk about the Great Commission. They talk about reaching out. They talk about evangelizing. They talk about sharing the gospel. Um, but I don't want our mission just to be a tagline. I don't want it to be just something we put up on the wall. I want the Great Commandment and the Great Commission to be my heartbeat. I want it to be your heartbeat. I want it to be our passion. You know, when you're passionate about something, um, you're all in, aren't you? Do you remember, for those of you uh, who are in a relationship, the very first time that you saw that significant other and you thought, ooh, baby. You remember that? Some of you are going back a few years, I know. But do you remember the first time that you were thinking about planting a big one on him or her? Somebody said there's a big difference in, in, in kissing your grandma and kissing your honey. I think that's true. There was some passion there, wasn't there? I, any of you following the Olympics? I, I, I am, but it's kind of tough. I can't figure out which sports are playing on what channel at what time. They're on seven different channels, and they're doing 14 million different sports. And, uh, but, I, but I love the Olympics, and I love the Olympians. I mean, to do what they do, they are passionate. They have a purpose, and they are passionate. And that passionate helps them fulfill their purpose. And they have a plan. And we ought to be just like them. Folks, we have the most important message in all the world. Without Jesus Christ, the world is going to hell. Without Jesus, they're going to be lost for eternity. And that ought to get us fired up. We ought to get excited about that. But instead, so often in churches, we talk about fishing for men. We have seminars about how to fish for men. 
We do conferences on praying for fishing for men, but we don't ever get out there and fish for men. You know what I'm talking about? You're not a real fisherman if you don't ever get a pull and get out there and get a line in the water. Kind of reminds me of that old joke. Maybe you've heard it. Um, the, 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 the county uh, game and fish commissioner had been getting some rumors and some wind of this old farmer. He was out there and, and, and he was catching lots and lots of fish and, and, and he, they just couldn't figure out how in the world he was catching so many fish. And so the game and fish commissioner kind of went up to him and said, hey, I, I hear you're bringing in quite a haul these days. He said, yeah, he says, sure am. He says, I'm just curious how you do that. He says, well, come on Monday and we'll go fishing. He says, all right. And so Monday came, they went out, got in a boat, went out in the middle of the lake. And that old farmer pulled out a stick of dynamite. He lit her up and he threw it in the water. Kaboom! Man, all these fish started floating to the surface. He says, okay, get a net, bring them in. The game of fish commissioner said, wait a minute. You can't do that. That's not allowed. Old farmer reached over in his bag, took a stick of dynamite, lit it up, handed it to the game and fish commissioner. He says, are you going to get busy fishing or are you going to stay busy fussing? Maybe we need to feel like we got a stick of dynamite in our hand. We need to get busy fishing individually and corporately as a church. How do we do that? Well, that brings us to the two models. In John chapter 1, uh, verse 46, we see one model. This is called the come and see approach. In John chapter 1, um, Jesus was recruiting his disciples, and he found Philip, and, and in verse 43, John chapter 1, verse 43, he found Philip, and he says to Philip, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida, and Philip found Nathanael, his brother, and told him, he says, hey, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I love his response. Uh, Nazareth, can anything good come out of there? And he just simply says, well, come and see. Just come and see. And folks, that's pretty simple. Just to encourage people to come and see. We need to invite people to come and see. We need to invite people to come and find out about Jesus. John chapter 4, the woman at the well did the same thing. Jesus talked to her. She had an experience, an encounter. She ran into the town and she said, Hey, I found a man who told me anything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? And, and, and they said, What? And she just said, Come and see. Come and see. Uh, Mark 16, verse 15, we looked at uh, the other model is what I call the go-and-tell approach. We can use the come-and-see approach or the go-and-tell approach. Mark 16, we talked about go everywhere in the world and tell the good news to everyone. So that's the go-and-tell approach. Uh, Matthew 28, where he looked at, therefore go make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them in the name of Jesus. So we see the come-and-see. We see the go-and-tell. Some, some churches kind of lean towards the, being the great commandment church. Some churches lean more to the go-and-tell approach, the great commission approach. But to me, it's not an either-or. I think it's a both-and. I think we need to encourage people to come and see, come and find out about Jesus. But we also need to go and tell people about Jesus. We need to model the message. Uh, it doesn't have to be an either-or. I think it can be a both-and. Um, one mission... Two mandates, two models, many methods. I want to share with you just some methods that we're now doing and that we're planning on doing uh, in the future. I, I read a statistic uh, the other day that 80% of all people who come to Jesus do so before they are 13 years old. Think about that. That's a shocking statistic. We need to have a vibrant way to reach young people for Jesus. That's why children's ministry is so critically important. Um, when you serve in the kids' area, you're not just serving a class. You are the pathway 
and the mediator for people coming to know Jesus. 80% of all people do so before the age of 13. We need to think about that. I've got some ideas that I might be sharing with you a little bit later about that. Uh, a little premature to share them now, but I have some ideas later that I want to share with you. Um, you notice we're beginning to start an emphasis, each one reach one. These ping pong balls, I see a lot of names in here. I see Dan and Nate and Grace and, and I see a lot of names. I want you to seriously pray about your one. And I want you to seriously do this. Take this card and, and write their name on the front or write their name on the back. Carry it with you. Put it on the dash of your car. Stick it on the mirror when you get ready in the morning. When you're shaving or beautifying yourself, you'll see that card and say a quick prayer for the one person that you know in your circle of uh, influence that maybe needs to come to know Jesus. I really believe we won't become passionate about people coming to Jesus until we begin to pray for people to come to Jesus. And, and there's something powerful about praying for that. When you think about it, in a way, prayer is a form of visualization. Um, you know, all great sports people, athletic people, they understand the power of visual, vis, that's a tough word, visualization. You know what I'm talking about? Some of them even have coaches that, 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 that they're called visualization coaches. Do you know years ago, Maury Wills, he was in the minor leagues for like 15 years. It was like forever. He was like an old man in the minor leagues, and the reason he never got bumped up to the majors is because his batting average wasn't very good, and, and they say he practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced until he had uh, blisters and blood on his hands he practiced so much. And finally, in a last-ditch effort to turn him around, uh, one of the coaches says, Maury, quit practicing. You and I are going to meet every day for Four weeks, and we're going to do nothing but visualize how to hit the ball. And through that visualization process, Maury Wills had a turnaround, and he began to hit the ball. And he hit the ball again, and he hit the ball again, and he hit the ball again. And then he began to steal bases. And then he began to steal more bases became one of the most famous baseball players of all times. I think it was the visualization, visu, visualization, visualization. That's got about 17 syllables in it, doesn't it? Visualization, five syllables. That's a tongue twister if I ever saw one. Uh, visualization, and when we pray, we're visualizing, we're asking God, God, Please help this person. Put somebody in their path. God, maybe even open the door for me to share uh, the good news with them. And when we do that, there's something that happens with that. How many of you have, uh, in the last two years, bought a new car? Raise your hands. What kind of car did you buy? Tell me. A red one. A red one. Okay. What else? A SUV. SUV. A white one. What else? Convertible? Now, let me ask you a question. Those of you who bought a car, did you plan on buying that color or that make or that model? I mean, like you said, this is the kind of car I want, and I'm, I'm buying that kind of car. Did, did, or was it you walk on the lot, you're like, whoa, I kind of like that color, or I like that car. Was it planned or accident? Plan? Plan? Necessity, <laughs> necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah, absolutely. I hear you, brother. Okay, now let me ask you this. After you bought that vehicle, did you all of a sudden notice the same kind of vehicle on the road and you had never noticed that before? How many had that happen? Raise your hands. Let me see. Yeah, you, you, you bought a Toyota and you're like, man, I, all of a sudden everybody's driving a Toyota. You bought a red car, and all of a sudden, there ain't nothing but red cars all over the road. Why is that? It goes to that visualization. See? A a a and you begin to see what it is you're looking for. 
And when we begin to pray for people to come to Jesus, when we begin to pray for opportunities to share the good news, I'll guarantee you, all of a sudden, open doors will occur that you never saw before to take your invite card and invite them or just talk to them or just care about them or just show them a little concern. Opportunities that you totally didn't see before, all of a sudden, they just open right before you. Why? Because you're open to the leading of the Spirit of God. And you're praying about that. And God will use His Spirit, and God will guide you, and God will open doors for you to share what needs to be shared, or to care, or to walk into somebody's life who's having a tough time, and you can counsel them and talk to them and encourage them and support them. All kinds of things like that. Um, We need to do that. This book right here says, at the end of the day, of all the evangelistic methods that exist in the world, the most effective one is for us just to invite or talk to someone that we have a trusting relationship with. That's the most effective form of evangelism. We are going to practice some other forms in addition to that, but that is the most effective. Some of the things I just want to make you aware, and I think we have a couple pictures up here. Elijah, I forget even what, yeah, there we go. Um, This is one of our postcards that we're sending out as a church. Um, When people move into our community, I kind of like this one. Um, Unpack the dog dish. Oh, that's not gotten checked. Call the phone company. Call, get the cable company. Buy light bulbs. Transfer mail. Find a good church. Uh, Is it on your checklist? When people move into our area... Um, we, we are getting about, we, we do about a mile and a half, two mile radius. Uh, we have about 100 to 125 or 30 that move into our area on a monthly basis. And when they do, they get two postcards. And this is just one of them. Uh, but they get a postcard from our church saying, hey, welcome to the area. Glad you're here. Uh, we want to be your church. Be glad to have you. Just come see us. Uh, that's one of the things we do. Um, We haven't had 500 people come to our church. But you know what? I think we're reaching out. And and, and I think when we reach out, I think God's going to honor that. Um, We're canvassing neighborhoods. Uh, We're going to the neighborhoods around us. We have these yellow sticky pads. We just put a note on the door and we say, hey, love to have you at our church. You're welcome to come to Mid Rivers Christian Church. Uh, We've we've prepared uh, some invite cards, I think. You've seen these. We have some out in the lobby. Uh, you can take these. has all our pertinent information, has the maps, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, feel free to use that uh, just to invite your friends. Or when you're at a restaurant, take this invite card and, and share it with someone. Give it to somebody. Um, here's a simple one. And, and, and we're going to look at doing this more. Is Facebook advertising. Do you realize that Facebook is an incredibly powerful advertising tool. Um, you know, Olivia does a really great job. She, she puts little graphic things on there for us to, you know, to promote some of the activities in our church. And, and all you have to do is share that. Just post it. You know, share it in your stream. What a non-threatening way to kind of let people know that our church is doing stuff and they're more than welcome. Uh, cool way to do that. Uh, we're going to look at doing some Facebook ads in the future uh, and, and reaching our area uh, with gospel through those Facebook ads. Um, those are just some of the things that we're looking at doing. Um, I'm excited about that. I think God's going to honor that. Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them all that I've commanded you. That's our goal, is to help people find and follow Jesus. Um, I'm getting fired up about that. And we're going to do some other things here in the very near future that will help us increase our evangelistic outreach. Uh, We're going to do more community service projects. And that takes all of us. And if you want to participate in that, Come talk to me about that. Uh, We're looking at doing one or two here in the very near future. Uh, Things that we can do as a church to get out in the community and just let them know, hey, we're here to serve. We're here to be 
a, a, a home for you if you don't have a church. Uh, we would like to be that church home for you. We want to help you find and follow Jesus. Would you stand with me as we sing? <laughs>
Jesus about the same time he gave the Great Commission uh, shortly before uh, with his disciples gathered into the upper room and Jesus said to them I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. I can't imagine partaking of the Lord's Supper knowing what was about to happen, but that's exactly what Jesus did. He took the bread and he took the cup and he instituted the Lord's Supper and he encouraged us to remember him as we fruit of the vine represents the blood that was shed on the cross. Let's pray. Dear Father, I just thank you for your son Jesus. I thank you for the sacrifice that he gave. Father, I thank you that you've given us the mission carry on that work and even by partaking of the supper that you instituted you tell us that we proclaim your death until you come Father may the world know the joy that can come as a result of your giving bless us as a church and help us to be a blessing in this community in Jesus name I pray Amen In a moment, Bruce is going to come and share some news um, with you. Um, well, here he is. He's right here. All right. Come on up, sir. Good morning. Um, just wanted to share with you the results of our vote from uh, two weeks ago. One, I want to thank you for your confidence in me and reaffirming me as an elder for the next uh, three years. I look forward to the opportunity. Um, with the mission that Bob has been sharing these last few weeks to, to be out into the community and uh, serving um, our community, as well as serving you within our, our, within our church body. Um, in addition to that, by uh, overwhelming majority, we also passed the bylaw change. Um, so next year, we will, you will be able to nominate both men and women to the position of deacon. So I wanted to share that with you as well. And then lastly, if I could have Ben Bingham, if he would come up on stage. There he is. I know this is a bit of a surprise. You didn't know this. <laughs> but uh, Ben has been serving um, as one of our elders for the past four years. And we just wanted to acknowledge um, his service to the church. Uh, we just deeply appreciate your leadership. Uh, you um, were chair, I think, when the whole pandemic uh, kind of unfolded uh, last year and uh, got us through the initial parts of that. And um, just want to thank you for your spirit-led leadership. You're a good shepherd and uh, your servant heart. And so, thank you. Thank you so much. the leadership uh, you. has a small token of appreciation for all your hard work. Thank so, you. thank you. Ben, uh, I know before you served as elder, you served, what, 35 years as deacon or something like that, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a little exaggeration, but I, I know several years as a deacon as well. Appreciate his service. Um, do want you to pray for us. Um, the leadership of the church is going to be in a very important meeting tomorrow night. Uh, we will be meeting with the city. Uh, we're discussing our entrance, our culvert that has collapsed out here. And so we're going to be having a collaboration meeting with them uh, to see what we do going forward. So uh, definitely be in prayer for us as uh, your leaders and be in prayer that the city is open to uh, what God has in mind and, and that things progress the way that we hope they do. So please be in prayer for that. That's tomorrow evening uh, and uh, we'll be doing that. I see some hands waving back there. Yes, help me. Tomorrow afternoon, 
What time is that? Somebody help me. One o'clock. It's tomorrow at 1 p.m. If that want to pray in and around that time, tomorrow afternoon around 1 p.m. Thank you. Appreciate you uh, clarifying that. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Father, just bless us and help us be a blessing. Father, we pray as we meet with the city that that might be a very productive and a collaborative meeting. Uh, we pray that your will be done. And uh, Father, we just uh, pray as we go out, uh, Father, open the door for us to share the good news. Uh, help us find a way. And Father, help us to um, just really be a, a light in our, our community and a witness in our world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.